Next on Currents News, a Queens pastor under arrest believed to have shared explicit photos with a minor. Now the parish is trying to keep the faith. We have to pray and support each other as well. A Republican giant is the latest victim of coronavirus. Tonight, we are remembering Herman Cain and saying a final farewell to John Lewis, a peacemaker and freedom fighter. An American whose faith was tested again and again. The founder of the Knights of Columbus is one step closer to sainthood. I'm Jessica Easthope with the family who says their son is a living miracle, thanks to Father Michael McGivney. Unpack Your Bags, our special travel series continues to roam around the Eternal City, this time statues with a voice. They've been chatting for centuries. The news starts right now. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. A pastor in Queens has been arrested, accused of sending sexual text messages to a teenage boy. The Diocese of Brooklyn immediately removed Father Francis Hughes from St. Pancras Church. Now parishioners and officials want to know if there are any more victim survivors. Currents News' Emily Druby is in Glendale with more on the investigation. I feel sad. I feel sad for this. Sadness and anger at St. Pancras Church. Their shepherd, Father Francis Hughes, arrested Wednesday on charges of sharing explicit photos and text with a 15-year-old boy. I cannot deny it. That's some kind of shock, of course. You know, because I cannot lie to you. Father Wallislav Kubrick is the new temporary administrator. The Diocese of Brooklyn quickly removed Father Hughes from his post, a move in line with their zero tolerance policy. The new priest leading the parish has made it his mission to help his flock deal with this painful accusation. We are here as a priest for them. We are the church together, so they have to feel home and they are always very welcome. In a criminal complaint, FBI investigators say Father Francis Hughes shared disturbing pictures and text with a teen after meeting him on a popular dating app. His arrest was announced by acting U.S. Attorney Audrey Strauss. The allegations against Francis Hughes are chilling and frightening to any parent, a person who, by the nature of his profession, is presumed to be trustworthy, allegedly victimized a child. The priest is being charged with one count of receipt and distribution of child pornography. He could spend up to 20 years in prison if found guilty. Father Hughes was the pastor here at St. Pancras for five years. After being ordained in 1980, he also served at St. Fidelis, St. Mary Mother of Jesus, St. Bernard, Cathedral Prep in Elmhurst, Immaculate Heart of Mary in Brooklyn, St. Helen in Howard Beach, Our Lady of Miracles in Brooklyn, and St. Columba. The FBI is looking for other victims, and they say anyone with information should call 800-CALL-FBI. In the meantime, Father Kubrick will be working hard to help his parishioners feel safe once more. We have to pray and support each other as well, okay? Mostly, as I said, talking to each other, you know, going with hope for the future. We cannot change the history. We can learn from the history. In Glendale, Queens, Emily Druby, Currents News. The Diocese of Brooklyn is vowing to reach out to parishioners with the hope of providing pastoral care. As Emily mentioned, the diocese currently has strong programs in place to protect minors. Some of the measures include creating the Office of Victim Assistance to help individuals who come forward with allegations of abuse. The office provides counseling, referrals for therapy, and other important resources. Every employee of the Brooklyn Diocese, including students, undergoes mandatory training designed to spot the signs of abuse and how to stop it. In the Brooklyn Diocese, Bishop DiMarzio meets with survivors and listens to them carefully. One result of those talks is the annual Hope and Healing Mass. To contact the diocese's toll-free and confidential sexual abuse reporting line, dial 888-634-4499. Top Republican leaders are rejecting President Trump's suggestion the presidential election in November be delayed. Trump tweeted this morning, with universal mail-in voting, not absentee voting, which is good, 2020 will be the most inaccurate and fraudulent election in history. It will be a great embarrassment to the USA. 
delay the election until people can properly, securely, and safely vote? Three question marks. Trump doesn't have the power to choose the timing of the general election. That's up to Congress. Across the board, congressional Republicans are dismissing the tweet. Herman Cain, a Republican giant and former presidential candidate, has passed away from the coronavirus. He tested positive for COVID at the end of June and was hospitalized. The 74-year-old ran for the White House in 2012. His irreverent style and rags-to-riches story made him a hero of Tea Party conservatives. During the campaign, he was known for his 999 flat tax plan. The White House is saying Herman Cain represented the very best of the American spirit. The pandemic is also cutting deep wounds in the American economy. New figures out today show the worst drop on record. And there's no let up in the number of U.S. workers who are losing their jobs. While all this is going on, lawmakers on Capitol Hill are still fighting over how to help ease the crisis. Karen Kaifa has the story from Washington. The coronavirus pandemic's devastating impact on the U.S. economy seen in two reports Thursday. The report card really validated that this was indeed the worst quarter in U.S. economic history. The U.S. economy contracted by 9.5 percent in April through June, an annual rate of 32.9 percent and the worst since the government started keeping track more than 70 years ago. And the Labor Department said first time unemployment claims increased for a second straight week to more than 1.4 million. Until the virus is tamed and really put in the rearview mirror, there's going to be a ton of uncertainty, not only on the part of consumers in terms of how and where uh, they, they are comfortable going out and spending money, but in terms of businesses. Some medical experts say another shutdown is necessary to stem the virus's fast and deadly spread, despite the economic pain. Right now, the only tool we have to control the virus is shelter in place and physical distancing. Some financial experts say Thursday's numbers underscore the urgency of congressional action. I really hope it's a wake up for Congress, individuals, families, Businesses, communities are hurting right now. A key point of contention in negotiations for the latest coronavirus relief bill, the $600 federal unemployment enhancement that expires on Friday. In Washington, Karen Kafa, Currents News. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is back in the hospital, not for coronavirus, but for a non-surgical procedure. The 87-year-old Supreme Court Justice got a bile duct stent replaced at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. It's unrelated to her cancer, which she announced had returned two weeks ago. She got the stent last year. We're told revisions are common. Ginsburg is expected to be released from the hospital by the end of the week. A five-year-old in Tennessee is alive and well after surviving a life-threatening condition in utero. A miracle birth credited to Father Michael McGivney, the founder of the Knights of Columbus, and one that could lead to his sainthood. Currents News' Jessica Easthope spoke with the boy's parents. That's the fluid. And that's two and a half weeks later when he was healed. Michelle Shackle and her husband, and Daniel, have 13 children. Her youngest, Michael, is the reason why Father Michael McGivney, the founder of the Knights of Columbus, is one step closer to becoming a saint. The whole journey with Michael has been the most beautiful, difficult journey of my life. During Michelle's pregnancy with Michael, he was diagnosed with high drops, a condition that causes fluid to build up in a baby's tissues and organs. Michelle's doctor said Michael wouldn't make it. She said he has a very severe case and uh, th there is no hope he will die. Michelle was distraught. Having lost five children over the years, she was terrified Michael, who they were calling Ben at the time, would be stillborn like her first daughter. But she insisted on choosing life. If the baby's not going to live, is this an abortion? And then I immediately thought, no, that would be an abortion. I could never do that. I love this baby and I'll fight for this baby. In their darkest hours, Michelle and Daniel, who sells life insurance for the Knights of Columbus, turned to the order's founder, Father Michael McGivney. Daniel said, I prayed to Father McGivney and I told him if he heals Michael, then we're naming him after him. So they prayed and begged everyone they knew to do the same. A few weeks later, Michelle and Daniel went on a scheduled trip to Fatima. Scared the baby had died while they were away, Michelle rushed back to the doctors when she got home. That's when the unthinkable happened. And I say, doctor, I was told there's no hope. And then she looked at me and she said, oh, you're the woman that just came back from Fatima. And so that's when we changed his name that day. Michelle was shocked. 
The hydrops was gone. Michael McGivney Shackle was born at 31 weeks with Down syndrome and a heart defect. But against all odds, he's thriving. He's now a healthy five-year-old. My miracle lives and breathes and smiles and says, Mommy. Now, Father McGivney's beatification ceremony has been set for October 31st in Connecticut. <laughs> because Mikey was healed, the shackles are forever connected to Father McGivney. Father McGivney and I share a birthday. Michael's the youngest of 13 and Father McGivney's the oldest of 13. God wrote the whole story. Father McGivney still needs one more miracle before he can be canonized. Michelle says all it takes is prayer because God is still writing the story. Jessica East Hope, Currents News. Bishops in Mexico are applauding a Supreme Court abortion ruling. Mexico's high court ruled four to one against a proposal that could have led the way to decriminalizing abortion across the country. The Mexican Bishops Conference welcomed the decision, saying a culture of life triumphs in Mexico thanks to everyone who joined together to pray and added, may life live. There's a lot more news headed your way. Remembering the life of John Lewis, the late congressman and civil rights leader, laid to rest today what former President Obama said about him. Plus, part of his legacy was the 1965 Voting Rights Act, why it's being discussed in Congress now. And Pope Francis calls it a crime against humanity, and today is the day to speak out about it. We'll explain. Stay with us. Now you can help us put your faith in the news. The next time you capture a newsworthy event, send us your pictures or video. It's easy. Go to netny.tv slash send us and you may see your submission on Currents News. An American whose faith was tested again and again to produce a man of pure joy and unbreakable perseverance. John Robert Lewis. Former President Barack Obama delivering the eulogy at the funeral of the civil rights icon. Obama was one of three former presidents at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta today, honoring the late Congressman John Lewis. Former Presidents Bill Clinton and George W. Bush also spoke, remembering a man they say made the country better. Daryl Forges is in Atlanta with this report. We have come to say farewell to our friend, Representative John Lewis was remembered today in a homegoing service at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. The 17-term congressman was honored by the youngest of friends. John Lewis was my hero, my friend. Let's honor him by getting in good trouble. And by former presidents from both sides of the political aisle. He always thought of others. He always believed in preaching the gospel in word and in deed insisting that hate and fear had to be answered with love and hope. John Lewis was many things, but he was a man, a friend in sunshine and storm, a friend who would walk the stony roads that he asked you to walk. Someday when we do finish that long journey towards free, when we do form a more perfect union, whether it's years from now or decades or even if it takes another two centuries, John Lewis will be a founding father of that fuller, fairer, better America. In return, John Lewis penned his own farewell to America. In my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now it is your turn to let freedom ring. In Atlanta, I'm Daryl Forges. As we celebrate the life and legacy of John Lewis, there's a new push in Congress to keep his life's work moving forward. Democrats want to renew the 1965 Voting Rights Act. I think that we ought to dedicate this election year to John Lewis. 
A key part of the act was largely invalidated by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2013. It required states and counties with histories of discrimination to seek permission from the federal government to make election changes like eliminating or moving polling places. The Democratic-led House voted to restore the bill, which was renamed this week for the late congressman, but the Senate refuses to take it up. Millions of people are being sold as slaves around the world right now, and today is when the world speaks out against it. The U.N. designating July 30th as World Day Against Human Trafficking. Pope Francis calls the evil a crime against humanity and says no one can stay silent. Di noi si senta impegnato ad essere voce di questi nostri fratelli e sorelle, umiliati nella loro dignità. There are more than 40 million trafficking victims and the crisis is growing worse. The peddlers of people are now exploiting those who've lost their jobs because of the pandemic, preying especially on migrants and refugees. <laughs> Muslim pilgrims converged on Saudi Arabia's Mount Arafat for the climax of this year's Hajj. The pandemic is cutting down on the crowds participating. The rocky hillside outside Mecca is being climbed by about 1,000 people wearing masks. Normally, millions of Muslims take part. The Hajj is one of Islam's most important requirements performed once in a lifetime. Still to come on Currents News, if you canceled your travel plans because of COVID, don't sweat it. We're taking you to Rome virtually. Did you know statues could talk? Well, in Rome, they can. not Let's hear what they have to say coming up next. Also ahead, two young entrepreneurs cooked up an idea and two business women adding the icing on the cake. For most Americans, Europe is still off limits because of the travel ban. So we're bringing a little slice of the eternal city to you, courtesy of our Vatican reporter, Melissa Butts. Today, she introduces us to the mysterious talking statues of Rome, a unique form of public criticism that goes back centuries. This statue is one of six in Rome known for speaking, a form of political dissent where written commentary criticizing political and religious leaders are posted right by the statue. It all started 500 years ago with this Pasquino, known as the first talking statue in Rome. The chatter began in 1501 when Cardinal Carafa, who owned the building attached to the sculpture, organized a literary competition. It quickly backfired when Romans started posting criticisms of the Curia and even the Pope himself. We had also other popes, for example, the popes who lasted for uh, too many years, according to the Romans. Then the prayers uh, and up on the Pasquino statues uh, were, let's uh, hope the Holy Spirit uh, to uh, have a pope that loves us, that fears God, but that, but that doesn't last so long. <laughs> Popes condemned the behavior but couldn't stop it. Some statues were taken off the streets and enclosed in museums. The Pasquino had guards placed by it day and night. Still, the sarcastic comments continued. Today is no different. Two notes hang by the statue. The first one is mainly celebrating the Pasquino statue as the place where the cardinals had always been criticized. The other one uh, is uh, asking uh, to the people uh, to keep on uh, doing uh, these uh, um, critics uh, mainly against the establishment. Just around the corner is the Pasquino's closest friend, the Abate Luigi. He would often engage in banter with the Pasquino, like with other statues. The Marforio asked, but uh, is it true that uh, all of the French uh, are thieves? And the Pasquino answered, no, not all of them, but Bonaparte, which is the uh, main part, uh, yes. <laughs> Bonaparte is the last name of Napoleon. Witty conversations like these were common on statues in the most populated parts of Rome. Piazza Vidoni was chosen as a Bat Luigi's home only around 100 years ago. Satire originally hung around Abat Luigi's neck until his head was likely stolen in the 1930s, making the commentary much more difficult to continue for this particular talking statue, one of six throughout the Eternal City. 
At the height of these statues' popularity, really only Roman nobility and academics could read and write. So what they did was they would share what was written with their neighbors. And this tradition still continues today, with these anonymous notes being called the voice of the Roman people. In Rome, Melissa Butts, Currents News. Ironically, a frequent target of the talking statues was Pope Nicholas V, credited with making Rome a center for literature and art. Next week, as we continue to roam the Eternal City, Melissa Butts takes us to the People's Piazza, a destination for early Christian pilgrims. Don't miss a stop. And finally tonight, a sweet story to end this newscast. Two young entrepreneurs in Colorado had a tasty little idea and some grown-ups served up a big treat to help them out. Micah Smith has the story. A cheesecake filled ice cream cone with sprinkles to top it off. I can do it. This is more than a kid's tasty creation. It's a serious business venture. We started planning out um, it on paper our flavors and what we would do with our cones. 11-year-old Desire Hawkins and 9-year-old Charlize Hawkins are the CEOs of Little Sisters Treats, and the cheesecake cone is their specialty. The girls have business meetings. <laughs> they are serious about this thing. The sister's mom, Marita Hawkins, says the young entrepreneurs love doing research for their business. So while picking up a friend's birthday cake from Sugar Sisters Bakery in Castle Rock, Marita told the owner she wanted to bring her daughters to the store and show them some baking possibilities. And I took my girls over there and um, the employee, I said, hey, can you go get the sisters? I want them to meet my daughters, the Little Sisters treats. And the Sugar Sisters finally came out. The Little Sisters were in for an unexpected treat. They were like bawling and they just like, we've been trying to find you on Facebook. We've just been waiting for them to come in. Sugar Sisters owners Molly Witt and Rebecca Leiden say Marita's story about her daughter's business stuck with them. And they wanted to uplift these little girls who will face many challenges. These are two young black girls um, who want to own their own business and with everything going on, we wanted to be authentic. Um, and then Becca texted me and was like, I have an idea. Why don't we give all of our COVID donation money to the girls? So after one month of searching for Zaire and Charlize, when they finally walked through the door. We said, oh my gosh, you're here. We're so excited that you are here. The two sisters, the sugar, sugar sisters, sisters. Um, we just, it was just meant to be. Witt and Leiden gave Zaire and Charlize $1,015. And while mom screamed with excitement, Zaire and Charlize were a little more reserved, but just as grateful and excited about what this means for the future of Little Sisters Treats. We want to get a food truck. We want to hire uh, other young girls. We want to inspire other children to be their own CEO. How does that make you feel to be your own CEO? Really like a boss. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that was Micah Smith reporting. The Sugar Sisters said many of the donations they got were for specific purposes or organizations, but the money they gave to the girls came from customers who left it up to them to find a way to help someone else. And that is Currents News. Please join us tomorrow night at 7 p.m. for a Currents News special program, Faith and America's Original Sin. The half-hour broadcast about racism and the church's role in putting an end to it airs tomorrow and throughout the weekend. Go to netny.tv for the complete schedule. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.